This is Joe, host of Webcomics Reviews and Interviews. Tonight, we're looking at World Building 101, Politics and Religion. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. <laughs> yeah, tonight's going to be all sorts of fun for obvious reasons, because I'm taking on the two topics that basically no one should ever talk about. So, obviously I need to throw in one obvious caveat, and that's that, hey, if I'm going to screw up terms and other things in any podcast, this is going to be the one. You know, I've seen people decide, go into major arguments about communism versus socialism, for that example. Or, is atheism a religion? I really don't care. I know I'm going to screw terms up. Um, all I can say is, deal with it, go with the flow, and... Hey, if you want to make a drinking game out of how badly I'm screwing up, go for it. But I advise something relatively non-alcoholic like a beer. Heck, let's make this light beer. Because it's pretty much water anyway. Um, the bottom line here is, I know I'm going to take somebody off. If you have a serious issue with it, I can always be DM'd over on Facebook. You know, I'm usually available... If you'll keep it civil, hey, we can have a long conversation on this as long as you want. But, the bottom line is, straight up, I know I'm going to get something wrong. Be prepared for it. Deal with it. And like I said, just go with the flow on it. That said, I'm looking at basically organizational structures. You know, If you don't want to include politics and religion in your comic, that's up to you. If you don't want to do it, fine. I don't really care. I'm just basically saying, hey, here's some really cool concepts. Let's have fun with it. You know, you're the writer. You're the person in charge. If you decide to completely scrap everything I'm talking about, you know, that's your personal opinion. Go for it. You think that's the best way to do your comic? then obviously that's the best way to do your comic. You can have an all-ages comic that has no politics or religion, and it works out pretty well. You know? I mean, there's a thousand and one examples of it. I don't care if we're going to something relatively simple as Family Circle, or, you know, a lot of your sword and sorcery comics, or even especially your science fiction comics. You'd be surprised how many science fiction comics there are that nobody really knows what the political structure is. You know, they think it's some sort of ultra-generic military democracy type of thing, and there's actually no actual political structure there. So for some bizarre reason, you don't want to include politics or religion, go for it. Heck, if you want to have some fun with it, you know... There are some really weird ways you can have fun with politics and religion in your comic that doesn't necessarily look at that. You know, um, Robot Chicken has had fun having, the, and there's even the anime in Italia where they basically have all the various countries represented as kids, and they just simply make some interesting political jokes about it. You want to go it that way too? Go for it. All I'm saying is I'm basically looking at political and religious structures here tonight. The one major writing tip I'll give you, though, is if you're going to be writing an attack comic on religion and politics, don't go broad, go specific. If you're trying to get into um, religious or political humor and you're basically trying to take down an organization... The four names I'm going to give you, like I would pretty much everybody, will be Gary Trudeau, George Carlin, Will Rogers, and good old Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. Each one of these four people are incredibly well-respected within their particular fields. What's really cool is, they do this because, I mean, yeah, they've got a lot of people that don't really like them and would rather see them suffer a rather heinous fate. But, at the same time, you've got a lot of people that, even though they disagree with the views of those four gentlemen, also respect the views of those four gentlemen. And, in fact, 
you got a lot of po polit uh, politicians that have actually listened to those four guys and have decided, that, hey, this is how I really think would be a really cool way of doing politics, based off what those gentlemen were saying. And if you don't believe me, just look up some of the stuff they were doing. The reason I'm bringing them up is because if you're going to be doing any kind of attacking of those various organizations, well, I'll sort of look at it in terms of medieval castle. If you, you know, if you go after the big baddest attack you possibly can, you know, and you basically just fired off at the castle, well, the castle is going to pretty much ignore you for at least the first dozen or so shots. You know, castles were sort of pretty good at dealing with catapult fire. So, but on the other hand, if you decided to go into sniper mode and figure out a way to get a uh, archer or a crossbowman reasonably close range, and he just started going after people, hey, you know, you could have that castle in pretty much no time. But again, we're looking at big, huge, broad strokes versus very specific attacks. You know, don't just simply go after something ultra generic. Go after the go after something as specific as you possibly can. Have some actual fun with it. Don't be ham handed at it. You know? If you really have to go ham-handed, go after it like uh, Jonathan Swift did in Gulliver's Travels. You know, have some serious fun with it. But, the bottom line here is, if you're going to be doing an attack comic, just start looking up, you know, Gary Trudeau with Doonesbury, Will Rogers uh, Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, and, of course, George Carlin. In fact, George Carlin is even available on YouTube. So, you know, it's, you know, just be very good at what you do. Don't, I mean, here's the issue. If you basically do a big ham-handed, big catapult-type attacks, you're going to end up with a very small rabid following that basically isn't going to be buying your stuff. You're basically going to be doing your comic just for the sake of doing your comic and that pretty much is it. You know, you're going to tick off the people you're attacking, which is probably what you want to do in the first place, but you're not actually going to be doing anything in terms of reforming that particular organization. And worse than that, you're going to basically come off as a bad guy. Yeah, I know, there's some people who don't mind that. But, if on the other hand, you actually aim your attacks, and you're very specific, and you actually build a case as to why you're attacking whatever it is you're attacking, or defending whatever it is you're defending, you're actually going to get some serious respects. You'll even have people that absolutely hate your stance, but will love the comic. You know? And the cool thing about having a really huge following of people who love your comic is that they'll actually support your comic. That is, you can actually make your comic into something that is actually making you money. Because you'll have a nice, huge audience to do it off of. So, you know, if you want to do those big, obvious, catapult-style attacks, go for it. On the other hand, if you actually want to make a point, if you actually want to reform things, if you actually want to do something good, yeah, you can still be a jerk about it if that's what you want to do. But the bottom line here is you want to do something good and actually make money off of it, then, very, then basically just aim better. <laughs> just like your mom told you. You know what I mean? Also, before we start heading into politics and religion... Because we are looking at how things are organized, you're generally going to find that most of the organizations are pretty simply set up along three different groups. We're going to call them the dual party, the multi-party, and the shadow party. Yeah, nice anonymous, that last one. Most 
people, most writers will try to keep it to the two parties, you know, because there's that nice little dualism thing, good versus evil. You know, you can pretty much decide who the hero is, who the bad guy is, and go at it from there. Obviously, I'm calling it a two-party uh, version because, well, you've got, I'm modeling off to the America, or specifically uh, United States of America, where it's the Republicans versus the Democrats. Like I said, it makes it nice and easy, and you automatically pretty much know who's who. You know, you don't really have to go into too much detail. And, you know, like I said, there's that little nice dualism thing. On the other hand, if you're trying to show a much more fragmented situation where everybody, different little, uh, all the various interests are represented and that sort of thing, at that point you're looking at more at the multi-party as per some, a lot of European countries that don't really have a whole lot of really big, huge groups but instead have a lot of really small ones. And it basically makes things a lot more interesting politically because, well, you've got all these different groups that have to align in order to get the bills passed or however they do it. So, multi-party is another really fun thing if you're basically trying to show some that just how fragmented politics makes people. And then, of course, you've got the dreaded shadow party. But in that case, we're looking more at Asia at this point. See, with Asia, you've got this really interesting situation that when people do politics, they have to basically allow that both sides have to save face. And if you allow both, respect both parties that way, well, you actually tend to get a lot more done. The only problem is that in order to do this, you have to do a lot of negotiating behind, you know, I want to say behind closed doors, but reality is we're looking more at the bars and the bathhouses. You know, people get together informally, get drunk, get relaxed, talk politics, decide that this is how we want to do them, deals are made, and then this works its way back to the person who's actually in charge. So, the really cool thing about this is you get everybody's able to present a united front. You know, we all get along. I like you, you like me. Ain't we cool? And, but you've got a lot of stuff going on in the back. I guess if you want to, you could also call this the duck parties. You know, because, well, with a duck, you know, things look nice and plastic. On top, you've got the fact that you've got these feet going really high speed where you can't see them. But we'll go to Shadow Party because it sounds nice and anonymous. So, and you'll find out that you can also apply this to a lot of your large religious organizations as well. So, again, if you're going to basically organize them in terms of organizations specific to the ruling body or the religious body, well, you're basically looking at a dual party system, a multi-party system with a Shadow Party. They just tend to work out really well that way. Sorry, as you can tell, I'm trying to keep everything that relatively brief because there's a lot of a lot of area to cover tonight. Um, the basic idea was to just cover this lightly as possible because I recognize right off the bat that you've got the people that are really trying to figure out really lo cool ways to handle this, and then you've got people who are well in the catapults. So, you know, just trying to keep it nice and light as relatively possible. Politics is really typically simple as far as history goes, you know. You start off with families that clump together. These families become clans. Those clans became, well, I want to say nations. Those nations became kingdoms. Those kingdoms got together and became empires, and later on countries. And then all these individual empires and countries ended up piling on and becoming planet-type one world governments. Yeah, I'm going to sci-fi mode. Leave me alone. And then planets, this one way or another, got organized into galactic empires. Or federations, if you will. In essence, if you really want to look at world governments, you'll notice that there is a interesting trend that smaller groups will get together with other smaller groups and those start congealing until you start getting a situation where all your 
You've got all these different large groups that can chill into larger groups. Those larger groups become largest groups. Then find out that they're not the largest groups and combine with a few other largest groups. And yeah, it's just basically everybody gets together and it's a whole hodgepodge. All right. So let's start somewhere. Let's start with tribes. <laughs> what you really quickly notice in the tribe is that you basically end up having a person in charge and a person who's the hero. They're not necessarily the same person. And of course that automatically means that you've got a political situation there because the chief is trying to maintain his crown, so to speak. And you've got the hero who basically is getting all this huge following and he, nine times out of ten, doesn't really care. Yeah, it's just eventually the chief is going to become jealous of the hero. And, you know, that pretty much becomes your basic politics right off the bat. In fact, that becomes a pretty good model for pretty much any comic book in terms of how the politics work. You're always going to have somebody in charge who notices somebody becoming heroic and becoming a fan, or more accurately, everybody's becoming that person's fan, and they tend to do what that they think that person wants done. And, well, that pretty much is how you become the villain, eventually. Either you're going to be the person in charge who decides to go after the hero big time and end up losing in all the just some really horrible ways, or you're going to be the hero and eventually become the person who's in charge, and then you have to deal with a new up and coming hero. Straight up, I would love to see a comic where that actually happens. So, and then you'll notice that is pretty much an interesting little motif because more and more, the bigger the whatever organization you're working with, the more and more people that become associated with that person. Just look at with Star Wars and the Rebel versus the Empire. Or, the, you know, how famous did Luke become? He basically became the face of the uh, Rebellion. Cute guy, a lot of, you know, Jedi power. It was natural for people to rally behind him. And, well, eventually you had him face off against the Empire, or the Emperor. And, well, we saw where that happened. So, but that's, you know, people seem to be tribal. At any rate, the bottom line is that you start off with the tribes. You know, you've got a really basic structure. You generally seem to have a couple of really basic structures when you have the tribe. You either have the warlord type, you know, big, strong, I'm the biggest, baddest warrior of the entire group and everybody follows him, or you have a council of elders, which is usually like a chief, a shaman, um, and a couple of the lead warriors. You may even have a tracker or two in there, and maybe even a blacksmith or somebody who's to represent the craft guilds, or if such as they are. Again, we're talking maybe a couple of thousand people. You know, that's real basic, real as basic as pretty much it's going to get. And, of course, eventually you're going to be looking at a lot more people when it comes down to it. But, interestingly enough, you're going to see each party is going to be organization along the way the tribe was. I mean, you sort of look at, um, yeah, I hate looking at the United States, but that's the one I'm most familiar with, so... You've got the person who's basically in charge. That's the president. You've got a couple of people he goes to for advice. His chief of staff, speaker of the house, you know, president of the senate. You know, he may be, and of course, let's not forget, he's got a whole cabinet of people he can go to for advice. You know, Galactic Federation. Okay, at that point you've got two different, we come back to the whole warlord thing, because the Empire, you know, Palpatine, definitely he's more of the warlord type. There's no question that if you go against him, you're screwed, and he doesn't really have much of uh, the council 
you know? But it's not that uncommon to see who's ever in charge of one of these big galactic things, how they set up along the same way as the United States President. You know, he's ostensibly in charge, but he's got a whole lot of people backing him. So. Now, in terms of actual government forms, you've got a lot of stuff that can be have, you can have some fun with. Without getting too sci-fi on it, and trust me, we're going to go there. Well, first off, you're going to have your basic theocracy. This is when you basically have the religion is in charge. And there's actually a lot of debate on terms of certain countries if the theocracy is in charge or what's going on. In fact, if you look historically, it gets really fun because look at the three pillars of the European feudal system. You had the nobles, you had the church, you had the commoner. Generally speaking, the three of them working together would create a really interesting situation, but you usually had the religion and the nobles usually were at each other's throats the most. You know, commoners just simply didn't want to deal with it. Smart people, those commoners. But, what you ended up having was some really interesting situations when it came to the nobles and the church. Especially when you had situations where the church... Uh, sorry, whenever the nobles could decide who was in what position of the church. Then again, you also occasionally had the church take on control. And then you had neat things like inquisitions. And we'll get to that when we start looking at the religious because it gets really weird really quick. But the bottom line is, is that you do have the possibility of having a theocracy take over. And this doesn't apply just if you want to take around the world. Um, you know, just a couple of governments here and there. You can actually apply this to your um, big galactic empires. Uh, Dune, for example, is led by a religious messiah for a couple thousand years. You know, the god emperor of Dune. So, the bottom line is with theocracy, it's some of these sort of religious figure that's in charge. Along the way, you also have the dreaded monarchy. The entire point is that you've got a, uh, somebody taking over, and instead of relinquishing control or allowing the control to go somewhere else, they keep the power within that particular family. You've got some really great nobles that are set up that way, and of course, you've also got a lot of really nasty nobles that are set up that way. Either way, the bottom line is you've got a king who's actually in control. This is opposed to, say, England, where the que queen or whoever the current monarch is, is strictly uh, you know, representational. That is, they have absolutely nothing to do with the actual running of the, of the actual government. I mean, they've got a voice, don't get me wrong. But it's not because, specifically because they've got they're the monarch, but because they've got a lot of other stuff going on for them. You know, they're either rich, uh, they've got a lot of popularity that tends to give them a lot of strength, or they're just really cool people to be around, and, you know, politicians like being around the cool people. So, you know, I'm just pointing out there's a difference between the way England is set up versus the way people think it's set up. For some reason, you've got a lot of people who think the Queen is in charge, which makes absolutely no sense. And then, of course, there's the oh-so-much-fun democracy. Democracies usually come into two stripes as far as actual policies combined. There's either the representative democracy, a.k.a. the republic, where basically you've got everybody only decides on who's in charge relative to their particular, who's in charge of their vote. And then this goes up the food chain. You know, Again, I hate saying look at the United States, but you got this really interesting situation where, you know, every two years or so we get together and we start deciding who's who gets to vote on our really important bills. Um, and then every four years we decide on well, who's got veto power, at least in theory. 
course, we've also thrown a lot of other voting on ballots and that sort of thing. But the point here is that with a republic, you basically have people that are voting into power, or otherwise, you have some sort of deciding on how they get in this situation. And they basically vote for the rest of the people, and they can have, and the people have some sort of way to either recall or to do something about getting these people out of power. Um, in the United States, we have the situation where they can be in control for, you know, two, four, six years, and then they have to be voted upon to continue. So there's that. Of course, if we're talking science fiction, there are some interesting variations. Um, you know, you've got, of course, voting by combat. Biggest, baddest people who can fight get elected in. That sort of thing. You've also got a limited democracy. That is, not all of the entire populace can vote. Uh, going all the way back to the Greek structure, for example, if you were having to be a landowning free man, hey, you could vote. Anybody else? You know, slaves, women, guys who didn't own property, hey, you're out. You could not vote. So, in essence, you've either got a representative or a limited democracy. You will rarely see a direct democracy where everybody votes on everything. Uh, the obvious problem with that is that the bigger your population gets, the less feasible that is. To sort of put that in perspective, America has roughly 330 million people. If every one of them could vote, oh, and let's make this really fun. Keep in mind that Congress, even though it doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot, does nonetheless do tens of thousands of individual bills every year. Mainly because there's a lot of stuff that, as per the Constitution and other regulations, our various senators and representatives have to actually have their word in. If you want to, say, um, marry someone from a foreign land, there are some places where you actually have to go through Congress in order to have that marriage okayed. You know? Plus, there are certain other responsibilities depending on state and tradition that the Senate and House of Representatives have to deal with. For example, um, the Annapolis Naval Academy, each senator has to is given the ability to have two people go into Annapolis based on that congressman say so. So a nice little tradition, but it's still something that has to be sort of allowed for. So if every if basically the point here is you have tens of thousands of bills going through Congress every year. They may not look that way, but trust me, they're busy when it comes down to it. And you got, it just you would not be feasible to have 330 million people vote on each one of those tens of thousands of bills. Now, imagine if we start scaling that up to we start dealing with galactic empires. You know, a direct democracy works really great when you've only got a few, maybe tens of thousands of people tops. And there's not really all much, that much they have to uh, vote on. But democracy, the direct democracy will eventually have to be replaced by something. Of course, it's also been argued that when you're dealing with American system and a few others, you're dealing more with an oligarchy. That is, you have a situation where corporations and businesses are in control. If you want to start looking at your various cyberpunk situations, that's sort of more accurately what you're looking at. That is, the corporations or whoever basically has the money gets to decide whatever the actual rules are. So, there is that, and that can actually work, especially if you're trying to set up a really corrupt situation. Um, and... The last two that really need to be discussed are communism and socialism. And here's where things gets fun. Communism is ideally everybody's equal. 
you know, everybody votes on their... Supposedly, it's actually an interesting variation on democracy. That is, everybody has an equal vote, everybody votes, and you really don't have one person's better than the other. The only problem is you get a variation of the direct democracy problem in that it tends to break down really quick somewhere around, you know, somewhere when you start getting thousands of people. At that point, does the idea of the, the communism, according to Marx, as opposed to certain of his predecessors, is that it was set up in order to eliminate the situation where you actually had politics and everything was supposed to be equal. Well, the problem you get is that the more people you have, the more people tend to specialize, and the more people tend to specialize, yeah, you start getting straight politicians. Not just people who have a voice and their fans, but actual politicians. So, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 people, communism, uh, pure communism, tends to break down really quick. Socialism, on the other hand, and this is going to get fun because, yeah, I know it's more of an economic theory than a theory of government, is that it's pretty much a government that's based on paperwork, for lacking a better phrasing in this case. This is where you start getting the Russian system and the Chinese system. That is, you've got people who are, well, let's just say more equal than others, and everything is pretty much serving the country. You know, as opposed to, say, a democracy where you've got... And, yeah, I know this is where it's sort of fringes on more of a capitalist situation, but in a democracy, you've got the concept that you've got a lot of stuff that's pretty much... Ideally, the government has a relatively loose reign. And if a lot of people who compare it, complain about politics here in the U.S. would start looking at other countries, you'd see that, well, you've got everything is pretty much run by the, run by the um, nation. Or the, you know. So you've got this really bizarre situation where you don't really have a whole lot of, you know, free market. You have the government is actually the ones that are in control of raising kids, press, factories, pretty much anything that's so important, the government has some sort of hand in. And yeah, I know it sort of impinges a little bit on economic theory more than government theory, but the yeah, situation basically holds. You know, you've got people who are doing boardroom stuff that are basically running the entire country as basically one huge government, or one one huge corporation with just basically different brands more than they are running it as a different its own little thing. So now let's take it into a sci fi issue. You've got the dreaded I mean the most obvious is that you're gonna have the hive mind. Which is everybody's basically well, you've either got a queen who's running things, and whatever she says goes, and nobody questions it. Or, you have everybody reaches a consensus on whatever it is, and they basically head in that particular area. With, of course, different specialists um, having a lot greater say in what they do. But the bottom line is, you've got this big, huge mind that's connected somehow by telepathy or pheromones or cybernetic implants, something, and everybody either votes or everybody takes commands from the same person. So, and of course, the last thing that needs to consider is that each one of these can, of course, be corrupted. That is, you can either have them serve some sort of high-minded goal, or the you've got a lot of backwater, or sorry, a lot of behind closed doors types of deals that are being taken on, and. Basically, whoever has the greatest money, whoever has the greatest power, whoever can intimidate somebody else, generally tends to win. And this goes all the way down the chain to the point where you've got, say, cops that will have no problem taking bribes. You know, you want to get out of a speeding ticket? No problem. How much money you got? 
You know, you got a murder? Hey, we can do that too, you know? As long as you basically don't have somebody who's trying to push the system too bad, nine times out of ten, you should be able to do pretty well in a corrupt system if you got enough money or enough, just something to intimidate other people with. So, that's the politics. Religion? All right, before we get into specific types of religion, let's do sort of a bridge. Specific strong church versus weak church. And you can replace that with whatever word you want, but the general rule is that when it comes to... We're basically looking at more of the theocracy at this situation, or pretty much the exact opposite. You know, if you're dealing with a theocracy, the situation is you've got some sort of religion that's basically strong. What this means is that who's ever leading the uh, government are will also happen to belong to that particular church. And the church will basically be looking at enforcing its moral values. This, of course, can be good or bad, but historically, we know it usually tends to be bad. And if we're talking, start looking at sick fiction, yeah, it tends to get even worse. Handmaidens tell, all I'm going to say. Inquisition? Hey, your strong church that's also in charge will also have an inquisition group. That basically goes after anybody who happens to disagree with it, brand them as heretics, and eliminate them, though, generally in the most painful way imagined. So, if you have a theocracy, you basically have a strong church. Its leaders are also in charge of the government, or at least they've got major inroads into the government. And odds are you've got an inquisition that has its own power. Conversely, oh yeah, and let's not forget you're also going to have a lot of huge buildings. Mainly because at that point the religion can funnel money into its own organization and therefore build itself up and look for all sorts of power. Conversely, if you've got a relatively weak religion, and I do mean relatively um, let's get real. The Catholic Church is not exactly a pushover. Um, sure, they, the government's going to be stronger, and then all of a sudden the church is basically more of a cheerleader role, supporting whatever the uh, government wants it to, to a degree. The church will also generally be in charge of charities, and generally speaking, you'll have a lot smaller churches. And in fact, if you go through history, you'll notice that the areas that have really strong, really strong religions tend to have ridiculously huge temples. Conversely, the when you start having weaker and weaker religion, the buildings also tend to get smaller and smaller. Yeah, I know there's some. I'm willing to bet there's some sort of phallic joke I can make there, but. General rule is, is that if you have a strong religion, it's going to be in charge. If you have a weaker, it's going to be more of a support role. And, you know, look at Europe and the United States where you've got the church. Churches tend more towards, you know, doing all the charity work and that sort of thing more than they tend to actually ruling, at least in theory. That said... So you, you know, you want to look at that, hey, you're more than welcome to. On the other hand, when it comes to religions, well, you generally tend to start off with, religion in history tends to get really interesting because you tend to get from, from small gods to a monotheism with different areas of atheism in there. I'm sure you're going to highlight atheism for just a moment. Because you've got some really weird situations going on there. Um, the first is that if you're going to have a fantasy realm and you're going to have actually gods rocking around, you might want to seriously rethink the concept of atheism as far as your particular area goes. Obviously, if you have Zeus and you can say, Yo, Zeus, and Zeus has a major effect on whatever, has a actual hand in whatever's going on, then you probably are not going to have a whole lot of atheists. You know, 
when he just got backhanded by Zeus, that's probably not the best time to say he doesn't exist. He'll probably backhand and smite you just on your own principle at that point. I don't exist. <laughs> you don't exist. But, um, I'm also bringing up atheism because uh, apparently you can believe in the supernatural and still be an atheist. It look at sort of look at Buddhism. You know, you've got a lot of people who claim that Buddhism is an atheistic religion. And yeah, I know there's going to cause a lot of controversy there, but the point is that because you can actually have be a Buddhist but not necessarily believe in the relevant gods, there's that certain level of atheism there. Go figure. That said, as far as the actual more supernatural religions go and I need back up for one more sec yes you can have a atheistic type of government we have that a lot so if you want to also tie in be sort of interesting to see an atheist with an inquisition zone and yeah I think Soviet Russia actually did try pulling that off at one point go figure Russian Russia is just weird. Anyway, building it up. Generally speaking, you're going to have you're going to start off with a shamanistic situation or animism. In essence, everything you see has some sort of spirit attached to it. Rocks, plants. The bigger something is, the more powerful its spirit is, and therefore you either got to celebrate the spirit somehow. Or honor its spirit. For example, with hunters, with Native American hunters specifically, you'd see them after they killed a deer, put a handful of grass into the deer's mouth to basically to show that the deer was in fact being honored. Um, that's not a bad way to go. And basically, the bigger the object or the bigger the item, the more powerful it was, the more powerful the spirit behind it. So even if the little pebbles had their own little spirits, the ocean would have a huge one. This, of course, would eventually lead into a pantheon as some of these the spirits basically fell off and worship and other spirits were, well, more widely worshipped. So you'd have pantheons of actual deities set up. And there's you'd have basically two different types. You'd either have one that's pretty much a straightforward, this is who the family is, and the family would be the main gods, and then you'd have all sorts of little gods, demigods, and that sort of thing. Then, of course, you'd have the way the Egyptian did it, where you basically ended up incorporating a lot of gods of those people that you ended up conquering into the main religion itself, because that you've got a lot of gods that just simply don't belong in the Egyptian pantheon if you actually look at some sort of overall theme. Um, right up from Pantheon, the Pantheon, you basically go one of two ways. The general rule is, you either go a straight monotheism, which is one god, that's it. Um, I'm going to point out Zoroastrianism. I'll never get that one pronounced right. Where basically you've got a good god and an evil god that are competing. You, in other words, you basically still have a monotheism that the good god is usually the one everybody worships. But you also got to recognize the evil god. Or the not so popular guy. That, you know, is generally seen as not the person you... You want to recognize that he exists. And occasionally... You know, figure out ways to make him happy. But generally speaking, you're going to have one God's favorite over the other. This is opposed to a monotheistic situation where you may have some sort of adversary, but generally speaking, you've only got the one God. Christianity obviously is uh, the king here because, well, You've got the one God, Jehovah, and you've, I mean, you do have an adversary, but let's get real, Satan isn't really considered a God on his own terms. He's seen basically as a fallen angel, it's more than he's seen as an actual God. So, 
monotheism is pretty much mixed up. Interestingly enough, if you were to basically go with some people, the atheism would obviously be the next stop, you know. At this point, you, it would just, you, I'm obviously a Christian, so I agree, disagree with a lot of the atheists. And this is, again, why you probably shouldn't be discussing religion. But, you've also got a really fun concept called conceptual. That is, you basically actually, instead of basically having some sort of being, some sort of superior being that you pray to for luck, you go with a straight concept. You know, the concept of love, concept of hate, that sort of thing. And again, you see this more when you start looking at science fiction and anything else. The Force is more of a concept than it is an actual deity, you know. Everything is permeated by the force. The force is good and evil. And it's just more of a concept than it is an actual supreme being type of situation. So, I think that pretty much rounds everything out. I mean, yeah, you've got agnostics who aren't really sure if there is a god or not. But, you know, I'm not really sure. I can't really put that in terms of or, or actual organization. I can put atheists as an organization, believe it or not. There actually are organized churches of atheists. Um, I'm going to point out that you do have a counter-religion type of concept because you do have people that, for example, do uh, worship Satan. And I'll point out real quick that if we're talking pantheon, you can go good, you can go evil. So, you know, if you're a shamanistic, obviously you're just going to be pretty much worshipping everything to a certain one degree or another. Either you might have favorites. Pantheon, you can basically go good or evil. I'll point out the Greek system versus the Lovecraft system. Both of those are both pantheons, but Lovecraft system, is, you know, Cthulhu is not your friend. So... Moving on from there, you've got the monotheistic, which is either an actual supreme being and everything under him, or you've got more of a dualistic situation where you've got good versus evil, and you've got to worship both of them, but you're probably going to worship the good one more than the bad. And then, of course, you have the conceptual, which is basically straight up, you know, like the force. You've got some sort of concept that you go with rather than a supreme being. And, of course, you have the atheists who don't believe in any deities whatsoever. Or that there's actually any kind of, ideally, any kind of supernatural. So that's basically it. I hope this helps somebody. The bottom line here is, though, is if, you know, if you're going to have more, if you're going, you don't need politics and religion as part of your comic. A lot of people actually don't include them, or if they do, they tend to default to whatever basically works. You know, the basic point is that politics and religion aren't a major part, so you don't really worry about it. Um, if you're going to make fun of politics and religion, go for the more specific shots rather than broad strokes. Nine times out of ten, it's just better to... It's an easier way to grow an audience, a lot of respect, and to have a much more successful comic. If you are going to have politics and religion, decide on how the politics and religion of that particular segment of the world you're working with, and you can actually, you don't have to decide, you know, I want 57 countries and I'm going to set them all up on different politics and religious scales. You only need, at best... You know, one political structure, one general religious structure, and then you can build that on as you go. Unless you have a really specific reason for doing it. Now, all I'm going to say is, in closing, have some fun with it. You can ha Obviously, you don't have to limit to stuff that's just in the world. Look at the hive mind you've seen in science fiction a lot. There's obviously no real world... Okay, there probably is, but, you know... 
we're looking more at the Vulcans and insects than we are at people. So have some fun with it. So have a good evening.